People who know Israel's history know the famous events. They know the 1948 war. They know the Six Day War. They know the Yom Kippur War. I think that in order to understand Israel and the Middle East today, it's more important to understand these events, which I will discuss, um, which were never called a war and have not been recognized as a war, and yet I think are crucial for our understanding of the country uh, today. I think that understanding these events helps us understand not only Israel, but also America's wars in the Middle East in the 21st century, and also, I think, Russia's military experience in, in the 21st century. When I was 17 years old, I moved to Israel from Toronto, from Canada, um, expecting to be there for a year, and I ended up staying in the country. That was 22 years ago, and I'm, I'm still there. I worked for a year on a kibbutz, uh, milking cows, and I liked it, I liked the people, I liked the language, I liked the country, and I decided that I was going to stay. When I became a citizen um, of the country, that triggered the military draft, and when I was 19, I was inducted into the army. I moved to Israel with a very simple idea of what, what the country is. I didn't know the details of the politics of the Middle East or the complications of, uh, of the country's regional situation. Um, and I found myself very quickly as a soldier, having moved to Israel, um, I found myself in a different country entirely, a country called Lebanon. When I moved to Israel, my, my parents were worried about me joining the army, um, and in order to calm them down, I told my father that he doesn't need to worry because I'm going to go to the Navy. Israel has a Navy, and I imagined that I would just be sailing in a boat up and down the coast, kind of like Baywatch, for, uh, for three years, and that's what I told my dad. I went to the, uh, the military office, and I explained my plan. I said I would like to be in the, in the Navy, and they looked at me, and they said, thank you, that's very interesting. Enjoy three years in the infantry. Um, I found myself at a military outpost about a half hour's drive north of the Israeli border, inside Lebanon, on a hill, um, and a base of earth walls and barbed wire and a trench and, and machine guns, an outpost that I think would have looked quite familiar to soldiers from, from the First World War. Explaining why this outpost was there requires a brief historical explanation. In 1982, Israel invaded Lebanon, hoping to push Palestinian guerrilla groups away from the border and got bogged down in a very complicated civil war inside Lebanon. And within a few years, Israel withdraws its army from central Lebanon and establishes a strip of land along, along the Israeli border inside Lebanon that was meant to protect our border, and we called it the security zone. And beginning in the 90s, the security zone became the scene of an increasingly uh, fierce guerrilla war with a new enemy inside Lebanon, a Shia group that was then unknown and is now quite famous. The group is called Hezbollah, the party of God. I arrived at this outpost in 1997, so the war had been going on for, for some years. And when we arrived there, it wasn't the war we were expecting. We had been trained for a classic war where tanks move over here and infantry moves here and there are minefields and, you know, war like we've all seen in the movies where people move from place to place and land is captured. On this hill, we were just sitting, uh, waiting to be attacked. Our biggest problem most of the time was, was boredom. In, in the morning, every morning, the entire outpost would wake up. There were about 60 or 70 soldiers in the outpost. So before dawn, we would all wake up and we would stand guard uh, in the trenches for an attack because we were told that that was the time that the guerrillas, that the Hezbollah fighters were most likely to attack. So we would see a shadow that moved and we would think that was the enemy or we would see a, a, a boulder um, and we would wonder if that boulder had been there the night before or, or if it had appeared somehow overnight. Bushes seemed to move. We started imagining all, all kinds of things. Um, most of the time it was, it was nothing. 
And for a while after we arrived at the outpost, nothing, nothing happened until I stopped believing that anything would happen. And then one day I was standing in one of the posts, one of the guard posts around the outpost, and I heard a strange uh, whispering sound in the air. I didn't react because from movies, I thought that shells made a whistling sound like this. And this sound that I was hearing was different. It was more like shh. So I didn't respond. But then there was an explosion uh, in the outpost and um, no one was injured, but it was proof that the enemy did exist and that this war that we were told about wasn't uh, an invention of our commanders. The base was about the size of a basketball court. We lived in bunkers underground. Um, and every so often, the Hezbollah uh, fighters would shell the outpost, uh, fire missiles at the guard posts, but it was always hit and run. We never saw them. We couldn't move easily in and out of the outpost because the roads were mined. They used to put explosive devices on the roads, so we could only move in armored convoys that were uh, quite risky, and it didn't happen very often. So we used to spend quite long, uh, long periods of time in the outpost um, without going home. And because water couldn't easily reach the outpost, we also uh, almost never showered, um, nor could we take off our shoes or uniforms. So you can imagine what, uh, what the place smelled like. Now, this outpost had a very strange name. It was called Outpost Pumpkin. All of the it, bases in South Lebanon had names of flowers or, or plants. So ours was pumpkin, and next door was outpost red pepper. Uh, there was outpost basil, and outpost citrus, and outpost cypress. And this is a very interesting aspect of the language spoken by the Israeli military, which is very different from other military languages. One of the tools that an army gives its soldiers, along with boots and guns and uniforms, is language. It's words to use to describe a reality that is often uh, difficult or impossible to describe, uh, certainly for 18 or 19 year olds. So often armies will give their soldiers aggressive language, for example. Um, the American army uh, on the radio calls its units things like cougar, hawk, psycho, names that feel very, uh, very aggressive. Or sometimes armies will use very bureaucratic language to conceal the most awful parts of what armies do. For example, in the American military, a dead soldier is called a KIA, which sounds like a tax form of some kind. It's, it stands for killed in action. When I um, became a soldier, I was made the radio operator and I was taught to speak a language on the radio. And when you describe wounded soldiers, casualties on the radio, the code word for that um, in the Israeli army is flowers. And the code word for, for fatalities for dead soldiers is hardufim, oleanders, which is a kind of poisonous white flower, but also a word drawn from the world of, of agriculture, of, um, of flora. And the point is that in Israel, we have a tendency to coat uh, this reality with beautiful language, with agricultural language, as if all of this was just a part of nature. So we're in the pumpkin, and we have flowers, and that's why the book is called Pumpkin Flowers. It's a, a kind of a nod to that strange language that we spoke in Lebanon. If anyone had been listening in to our, to our radio in Lebanon, they would have thought that we were in some kind of botanical garden. Now, this outpost pumpkin, outpost pumpkin, was famous because of an incident that happened a few years before I got there. I arrived, I was inducted into the army in 1997, and the outpost, um, and I'm going to show you a video in just a second, the outpost became famous because of a video filmed there in 1994, at the end of 1994. Remember, when you see this video, it's just a short, uh, short video, that this is years before we have smartphones, years before we have Facebook or Twitter, it's before most people have internet, it's before we talk about viral information. Um, this is basically medieval times, 1994. Before almost anyone else understood the power of the, of the video, the power of the image, Hezbollah understood it and sent a force to attack Outpost Pumpkin one Saturday morning with one soldier who was armed, not with a rifle, but with a, a video camera. So what you'll see now is a video uh, filmed by Hezbollah fighters attacking Outpost Pumpkin. The fortress that you see on top of the hill, it looks like a big concrete bunker. That's Outpost Pumpkin, and we can show the video. Come 
Um, what we just saw, uh, that image of the Hezbollah fighters sticking a flag into Outpost Pumpkin, evokes other famous images that, um, that we might remember. For me, as a, as a North American, it evokes uh, the Marines on, on Iwo Jima uh, during the war in the Pacific, or maybe the Red Army soldiers hanging the flag on the Reichstag. So we've all seen famous pictures of flags. What's different about this incident is what you don't see in the video. The Hezbollah fighters run up to the outpost, stick a flag in the outpost, and that's where the video ends. So you don't see that they just turn around and, and run away. They run back down the hill. The Hezbollah fighters don't capture the outpost. They weren't trying to capture the outpost. When the Marines stuck their flag on Iwo Jima, they had actually fought for the island. And of course, when the Red Army troops hung the flag on the Reichstag, they had captured Berlin. It didn't occur to the Marines or to the Red Army to stage a photograph with a flag and avoid the battle entirely. So here we see warfare start moving away from what we typically understand as warfare, territory being conquered or lost, and things begun, begin getting quite uh, philosophical. Reality begins to, to blur here in 1994. The uh, fighters on the hill with their video camera aren't soldiers in the classic understanding of what that means. What they really are is storytellers. They're telling a story that they're filming and the outpost isn't a military objective. They're not trying to capture it. The outpost is a stage. The story that they're telling is, uh, ha has two audiences. One is their own supporters. To their supporters, they're saying, look at us, look how brave we are. Look at us take on the strongest army in, in the region. We're not afraid. And the story they're trying, the, sec the second audience for their story is, is me, Israel. And the story that they're trying to tell me is, you are losing. And it works. This video, which is broadcast immediately after the incident, in, uh, at the end of October 1994, is shown across the Middle East. It's broadcast on satellite television, which is a new technology at the time. And it's seen across the Middle East and many um, people across the Arab world applaud Hezbollah for their heroic attack on, on an Israeli outpost. In Israel, it's picked up by, uh, by, by television stations in Israel and it's just shown in a loop. And all Israelis see the humiliation of, of our army. A fighter runs up and there seems to be no response from the Israeli soldiers and he sticks a flag into the outpost and this incident becomes known in Israel as um, the disgrace. So from this moment, Israelis begin to think that they're losing this war in, in Lebanon. Remember, militarily, nothing happened. 
Nothing was captured. Uh, the line in Lebanon didn't change. There was no strategic gain for Hezbollah. All there was was a video, but the video managed to change the course of, of events, not because it captured territory, but because it started to work on people's brains. Now, of course, we um, are used to videos like this. We've seen videos from ISIS. We've seen all kinds of things on our phones, on our, on our laptops. Uh, we've seen videotaped attacks in Paris, and we've seen um, videotaped attacks in too many places. Um, I, I believe that in many ways this is the, is the prototype. That kind of very primitive video was one of the first examples of the successful use of this kind of psychological warfare in, in a conflict like this. And that's one of the reasons I think that this war in Lebanon, which even Israelis didn't think of as a war at the time, is in fact the first war of the 21st century in many ways and is worth a lot more attention than it has received until now. But of course, a war is not just a matter of ideas and strategy and, uh, and, and videos. A war is primarily about very young people, often men who are taken from high school um, and thrown into a very uh, complicated and, and scary uh, situation. And when you try to write about a war, you can either write about the great sweep of the war and the decisions of the generals and treat the, the little soldiers as pawns being moved from place to place, or you can see that what matters about a war story is the humanity of, of the soldiers, first of all, and the rest of the war is just the backdrop, it's just background. The writer who most influenced me uh, in this regard, one of my literary heroes, is v Vasily Grossman, whose work I've read in English. His writing about, um, primarily about the Second World War, his reporting from um, everywhere, basically, including Stalingrad, um, and his, his stories and the books that he published after the war are, for me, the perfect um, illustration of how uh, writers should approach uh, war. For him, the human being was always at, at the center, and I regret that I'm in Moscow, but Vasily Grossman isn't here. Uh, I have a few questions that I'd, um, that I'd like to ask him. But I tried to tell this story, the story of this outpost and this, and this war in the 1990s through human characters. I'm one of the characters. Part of it is about my own experiences, but I, I chose a few others. And the most interesting character in the book, including me, in my opinion, is a, is a soldier whose name was Avi who served at Outpost Pumpkin a few years before I got there. Avi was a good example, I think, of that generation of Israelis, my, my generation of Israelis, not very ideological, quite cynical about the government, about the army, but at the same time aware of what the duty of a young man is in Israel. So although they were cynical about the army and although they hated the army, um, they went to the army because that's what you needed to do. And that's how a character, an anti-militaristic, anti-establishment, very difficult, uh, well-read kid like Avi ends up at a place like Outpost Pumpkin in, in the 1990s. Because of course, that's, that's what it means to have a draft. It means that everyone's in the army, not just people who, who want to be there. So I'll read just briefly a letter that Avi wrote from Outpost Pumpkin in 1995. I'll read you the letter and then I'll have something uh, translated. It shows something of his, of his character. He was a, a great writer and he had an amazing ability to see what was around him at a time when other soldiers, myself included, were so exhausted and, and scared and worried that we didn't, we didn't have time to pick up our heads and, and look. Morning will rise soon here in Lebanon. This is Avi writing before dawn one morning at the outpost and fog will cover the land again. Only the hilltops will be visible above it, a view that is cold and enchanted, like the set of a play, or a picture from a story or fantasy film. He's writing this to a girl, by the way. To the south is Beaufort Castle, that's another Israeli outpost, haughty, dark, and threatening above the mist. Afterward, the sun will start to come up and paint the sky beyond Mount Hermon, many shades of pink and red, turning the fog into a white and unthreatening carpet. In the end, the sun will rise entirely and reveal itself. The fog will dissipate, and once again, we will see Lebanon, beautiful and wild. Everything here is a kind of illusion. Opposite the place where I'm sitting on a hill is a beautiful villa with a large garden and red shingles. 
It's a pastoral scene, but if you look closely, you see the bullet holes all over the house, and you see that the garden is neglected because no one dares live there in such dangerous proximity to the outpost. It's very hard for me to put my finger precisely on the feeling I have when I'm here. It's kind of sadness mixed with longing so deep that sometimes it's painful. And fear, of course, it's strange, but the fear doesn't bother me at all. It's part of the sadness and the longing. It's with me all the time, but not directly, kind of sneaking up on me. That's how it appears when you're alone. I mean, not when you're literally alone, but when I step away for a second and think about home, about my friends, or about a love story that I haven't started yet. <laughs> Avi did uh, most, spent most of his service at, at the pumpkin. Um, he went into the army in 1994 and was uh, meant to finish his army service in March 1997. In February 1997, a month before he was uh, supposed to be discharged from the army, he boarded a helicopter um, bound for Outpost Pumpkin. The war was getting worse and worse, and there were more and more bombs on the roads. So the army decided not to use convoys to drive the soldiers into Lebanon, but instead to fly them in on big transport helicopters. One of the helicopters was uh, headed for Outpost Pumpkin, and the second helicopter that took off at the same time was going to a nearby Israeli base, the one at Beaufort Castle, and there were 73 men on both helicopters. On February 4th, 1997, those two helicopters took off from northern Israel, crashed into each other, and all 73 uh, men on both helicopters died, including Avi, Avi Ofner, who was 22 uh, when he died. The crash of the helicopters is the, uh, the straw that breaks the camel's back. After the helicopter crash, Israelis start asking questions about this war in, in Lebanon. Israel is a very small country and people feel casualties very, uh, very directly. Everyone knew someone um, on those helicopters, and people still describe the crash of those two helicopters, which we call the helicopter disaster. It's described as an atom bomb, an atom bomb going off in the country. A few weeks after the crash, a group of mothers of army-age children get together and decide that if the country's leadership isn't brave enough to pull the army out of Lebanon, they're going to do it themselves. They call themselves the four mothers, Arba Imahot, like the four mothers from from the Bible. And at first, no one wants to hear what they have to say, and people don't take women seriously because how could they possibly understand important strategic affairs like whether the army should be inside or outside Lebanon? And they are mocked at the time. People say that they're speaking from, their, from the uterus. Uh, the mothers begin protesting across the country. They, be, they manage to convince more and more Israelis that the presence in Lebanon is not, uh, pr is not saving lives but is costing lives and that the army needs to be pulled out. And over three years, between 1997 and 2000, public support for the enterprise in Lebanon falls apart, but soldiers continue to die in Lebanon. And those three years are precisely the years that I served at Outpost Pumpkin. I was uh, inducted into the army six months after the helicopter crash. There was one squad on the helicopter um, headed to Beaufort Castle um, that had just lost one soldier because he went to officer's training. So he wasn't with them on the helicopter. So this soldier, whose name was Har'el, was at the officer's training school when news came um, that the rest of his unit, all of them, without exception, had been killed. Har'el didn't go crazy or leave the army. He finished officer's training, came back to our unit, and uh, received a new batch of fresh recruits, and that was me and, and, and my friends who joined, the, who joined the unit in the summer of 1997. And he took us back to the same place. Once on TV, he was asked how he went back to the army after that news. How, how could he possibly do it? And I think the interviewer wanted an ideological answer. They wanted an answer about Zionism, Herzl, King David, some kind of big answer about how he, uh, how he went back to the army after hearing that all of, all of his friends but him had been killed. So how did you go back to the army, he's asked, and he shows no emotion at all. He says, on the bus. And I think that's, uh, that says a lot about the generation of Israelis that I met in the army. Um, not very ideolo ideological, um, perhaps not inclined to openly express ideology, but at the same time very tough. 
Over the three years of my army service, public support for, for the army in Lebanon drops. When I began my army service, everyone believed that we needed to be in there and we were seen as heroes. By the end of my army service um, in 2000, no one believed that the army should be in Lebanon and we were instead, us the soldiers, we were seen instead as a kind of victim. In, uh, on May 22nd, 2000, shortly after I got out of the army, my unit uh, blew up outpost pumpkin on the same night that all of the outposts with their beautiful names were blown up and the army uh, pulled out of Lebanon for the last time. And that, in our understanding, was how the war ended. Hezbollah wanted South Lebanon, and we gave them what they wanted, and so the war would end. We understood Hezbollah as being, a, being kind of like the Viet Cong, an ideological actor interested in a specific piece of land, South Vietnam in the case of Viet Cong. You give them what they want, and the war ends. If you read newspapers from the 1990s, from the years of these events, you'll see that these events were not on the front page. What was on the front page, what was in the front of everyone's attention was the peace, peace process, peace negotiations. In those years, you heard Israelis use the term New Middle East. Shimon Peres talked about a New Middle East which was being created in negotiations by responsible leaders who were going to lead the population of the Middle East to a better future, a future of peace and, and trade. And that was what was important in those years. This was much less important. Few people were, were paying attention beyond the soldiers themselves, of course, and our, and our families. In retrospect, though, this was far more important. And the peace negotiations and the idea about a new Middle East, this was all, unfortunately, this was all dreams. And what was important about the 1990s, the important events of the 1990s, were these events, the events in South Lebanon. I think anyone following the Middle East over the past 10, 15 years understands that the new Middle East was born in the 1990s, but it wasn't born at a peace conference. It was born at Outpost Pumpkin. It's a Middle East where the strong actors are organizations like Hezbollah, not necessarily states, organizations driven by um, extremist, Islamist ideology. It's a Middle East where wars are not wars of tanks capturing territory or uh, infantry brigades advancing, but wars of bombs on roads, shelling, hit and run, and, and a whole lot of video. So I think that if we understand the events in South Lebanon and if we understand the story of, South, uh, of, of Outpost Pumpkin, the present becomes much much easier to understand, not just the present in Israel and not just the present in the Middle East, but I think the, the 21st century is much easier to understand if we understand um, what I saw with my friends when we were too young to know what we were seeing. It took me many years to, to figure it out. I got out of the army in 2000, around the same time of the withdrawal, and this book was published last year. After years of thinking about it and trying to write about it and failing and trying to find my old friends from the army and trying to find other people who had served at this out, outpost going around the country, trying to put all the, put all the pieces together. I hope I've done justice to the, to the events, and more than anything, I hope I've done justice to the, to the men who served with me um, in Lebanon, who are among the finest people I've, I've ever met. Спасибо большое.